Thank you very much for coming today. My name is Allison Tuzo, and I would like to welcome you to the second event in the second season of our Gaia Then and Now webinar series. In this series, we have explored Gaia in both ancient and modern realms. Today, we will explore the intersections of Gaia theory, alchemy, the tree of life, and contemporary sciences to deepen our relationship to the earth and find new ways to deal with our climate crisis. If any questions come up during the event, please feel free to use the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, to submit them. We will have time for a discussion after the presentation. We have been lucky enough to have Jules Cashford involved in several events in the Gaia Then and Now series. In fact, her first presentation in this series laid the groundwork for all of the events that have followed. We're very happy to have her moderating today's event. I will now quickly remind you of the background and experience she has, which will make it obvious why she's such an important part of this series. Jules Cashford studied philosophy at St. Andrews University and received a Carnegie Fellowship for postgraduate research in literature at Cambridge, where she was a tutor in tragedy for Trinity College. She then trained in Jungian analysis with the Association of Jungian Analysts in London and taught mythology. Her books include The Myth of the Goddess, Evolution of an Image, which she co-authored, The Moon, Symbol of Transformation, A Translation of the Homeric Hymns for Penguin Classics, The Mysteries of Osiris, and a novel called The Crane Dance. She was co-editor with Tom Singer and Craig San Roque of the Ancient Greece Modern Psyche series. She has made two films on Jan van Eyck, and three films on Gaia. Gaia, Mother Goddess Earth of Ancient Greece, The Return of Gaia, and the Eleusinian Mysteries. Jules serves as the trustee for the Gaia Foundation, an environmental nonprofit. Welcome Jules, and thank you for moderating today's presentation. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce you to Stefan Harding. He's been a friend of mine for many years now. He's a scientific ecologist with a doctorate in behavioral ecology from Oxford University. He taught conservation biology at the National University in Costa Rica before becoming a founding faculty member of Schumacher College in 1990, which is where I met him. He coordinated the MSc in holistic science at Schumacher for almost two decades and has been the college's resident ecologist and tutor ever since then, making an incredible difference to how Schumacher worked. His, the first teacher at the college was, amazingly enough, James Lovelock, with whom he maintained a friendship and scientific collaboration over many years. Stefan's books, he has two books, Animate Earth, and the last one just recently, Gaia Alchemy. And he's going to talk to us today with the most magnificent slides about Gaia and the tree of life. Thank you very much, Jules. So hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to see you. I, I always like to start with a little bit of music. So this is um, a quattro from Venezuela, where I was born in South America. And this just to prepare us for our exploration, I'll just play you a little bit of music. So just ponder those words, Gaia and the Tree of Life. So we're going to do, we're going to use various approaches. One is, of course, the cognitive approach, which we have to do because we're using words. But also we're going to be using our intuition and our feeling and our sensing a little bit. So just prepare. So 
we're going to explore the connections between Gaia, both mythologically and scientifically, and the Tree of Life, which of course is one of humanity's most primordial archetypal symbols. And we're going to see what happens when we, when we put them together. This is a, a, a sacred tree in England. Um, we still have them, despite all the destruction in the English countryside. So <clears throat> I think there's one tree of life, but for this talk, we're going to explore three aspects of this one tree of life. Um, the first is the alchemical tree of life. So we're going to see what the alchemists made of this idea of the tree of life. And then we're going to look at the scientific Gaia tree of life from James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. And then thirdly, we'll have a look at the Kabbalistic tree of life. And then at the end, actually it's a fourth. It's always good to have a four. The fourth is going to be the deep ecology tree of life, which I haven't put on here. So that's the order of play. Alchemical tree of life, scientific Gaia tree of life, and Kabbalistic tree of life. Okay, so let's start with the alchemical tree of life. Um, so here you can see this image. Um, this is from a, a temple in India. And as you can see, it's of, the, of these three beautiful trees. And I'd just like you to um, go into this image for a little while. Just um, let it work on you. Imagine, you can imagine if you like, that we're in a wild forest in ancient India. And we come across a forest clearing. And in this cl clearing are these beautiful trees. These are almost like assistant trees. And this is the main tree of life. And you see with all the branches and leaves. Actually, it's a carved screen. So when the sun shines through the screen, shadows are made on the floor of the temple, showing this, the tree of life. And of course, it moves with, as the sun moves. It's an amazing, amazing uh, cultural achievement to make this, this tree of life. So just spend a little bit of time entering into this image. I mean, this image says it all, really. I could just pack up and go home now. Everything we need to know is in this image, if we know how to connect with it. So just have a have a look at that image for a little while. Not very long, just a little while. I hope you're getting some sense of the beauty of this image and the, the beauty of the tree of life itself. So uh, this is where it is. It's 14th century and it's a mosque, so it's an Islamic image. But of course, it's carved in stone. Now, this is a more recent alchemical tree from an alchemical image series called the Splendor Solis. And there's a lot going on here. Um, but this is our introduction again to the, the Tree of Life alchemically now. First of all, notice there are these two figures here who are talking to each other. And then there's a tree itself with a crown at the base. Can you see the tree is actually growing through a crown? And that suggests that this is a royal art. Whatever's going on here is something very important, very royal. And you see this man climbing up the ladder. He's climbing up a ladder with seven rungs. And the number seven is extremely important in alchemy, as, as you'll see. And look what he's doing. He's, he's actually sort of cut off a branch of the tree. And he's giving it to this man here who's actually holding, I don't know if you can see, a kind of dead branch. But he's being given a live branch from the tree by this man who's cut the branch down. So he's being given a live branch. And up here you see these birds. There were black birds and they're turning white. It's all very symbolical. So what's going on here is that the tree of life is going to help this man in red on his journey towards his own individuation, which is somewhere in the landscape. And he's got this dead branch, which hasn't helped him very much so far. He needs a live branch from the actual tree of life. And he's been given that by this other figure. And these birds here, you see that they're, they're black birds, see it there, but they're turning white. Can you see this one here, this bird here? It's got a white head, it's turning white. And they're flying off in different directions. So this, is, this shows you something about the immense healing power of the tree of life. It's giving this man who's in search of himself, in search of, his, of the self, um, all tremendous help um, and we can't make any progress 
on our voyage to experiencing Gaia as a live living being without help from the tree of life. So this is from um, the Splendor Solis, um, as you can see. So you've got the reference if you want to contemplate this image. It's well worth doing. And there's lots more going on here, which we haven't got time to look at. Um, so you get the idea, this tree of life has this life-giving power. That's why it's called the tree of life, obviously. And it's going to help us in our journey to really experiencing Gaia. Because I think unless we have a deep experience of Gaia, um, beyond just an intellectual conception of Gaia, we're not going to solve the crisis. All of us have to feel that we are living inside a real gigantic planetary living organism. Um, and we can only do that with help from the depths of psyche. We can't just do that from our intellect. And that's what the tree of life is doing. And that's what this alchemical image is doing. In fact, that's what alchemy can, can do for us. Okay, and here's, here's uh, the, tree, another, the same tree, really, the, another version of the alchemical tree of life. We're just going to go deeper into it now. So you remember in the previous image, let's just go back to it, there are these seven steps going in the ladder which takes you into the, the canopy of the tree. Well, here are um, the seven steps again, but this time they're appearing as metals and planets. So those seven steps are now taking on a much deeper significance. And you can see these two characters here discussing what's going on with the tree. Um, we, we don't know what they're talking about, but obviously they're very interested in, in the tree here. And these seven steps or seven operations or seven metals are the following. You can see here is the sun and the metal is gold. And what these mean will hopefully become somewhat apparent as we go through. Then... We've got Mars, which is iron. The metal is iron. There's the symbol for Mars. Uh, and then we have Venus, the symbol, uh, the, sorry, the metal is copper. And then we have lead, Saturn, and tin, Jupiter, and then the moon, silver, and finally, right at the very top of the tree, we have Mercury. The metal is mercury. So we have the planets and we have the metals. And these in alchemy are both the, the physical planets and physical metals, but also they're very symbolic psychologically. If we meditate on these metals and planets in a certain way, it seems to foster um, our process of individuation, or if you like, our process of coming into the living presence of Gaia. Um, one thing I'd like to say about these alchemical images, in fact, all these all these images, is that um, we haven't created them. This is very important. We haven't created them. We've received them from nature herself or from Gaia herself. Um, it's as if these seven metals, seven planets, seven operations, which you'll see in a minute, um, are the way nature works. It's as if nature has revealed the way she works to us in a very deep way using these images um, so it's no good thinking that we create the images we have to realize that we've been given them by nature then they have their own autonomous life um, and their own objectivity uh, and and we get rid of that idea that these are these are just sort of creations of, of the human mind they're not the human mind receives them from the depths of nature so um this is another alchemical tree, or the same alchemical tree, revealing different aspects of itself. This time, here are the same two people talking. Now you can see that there are circles, um, which are also associated with the alchemical tree. You see how the imagery is sort of building up. And here are the seven planets and metals around the outside. And this next image, uh, oh, that's the reference for you, where to find that image. The next image is putting all those things together. So you can see here we have the metals and the planets and here we have those circles I showed you. This is the image we're going to be focusing more on most of the Azoth Mandala from Basil Valentine from 1659. And here are, just to show you, here are the metals and the um, planets. But now we're adding an extra dimension, which is a, an operation. This, this one is calcination. And we're going to, I'll explain what these operations are in a minute. The next one 
is dissolution. So we have Jupiter, tin, and the operation is dissolution. And then we have Mars again, now associated with, as before, with iron, but now the operation is separation. And then we have the sun, gold is the metal, and the operation is conjunction. And then we have Venus, copper, fermentation, and then Mercury, Mercury is distillation, and finally we come to the moon, silver, coagulation. So these are the calcination, dissolution, separation, conjunction, fermentation, distillation, coagulation. These are the seven operations that one can work on within oneself to move oneself towards an experience of Gaia. But I also think that they are the seven fundamental operations that happen in physical nature, in Gaia herself. So Gaia, our planet, has calcination. She has dissolution. She has separation, etc., etc. And I'll try to give you a hint of how, how those work, both within ourselves, in our psyches, and in Gaia. Because, of course, ultimately, the physical world of Gaia and the physical world of the universe and our own psyches are utterly indissoluble. So these seven operations are archetypal. They occur in the whole of nature, including within ourselves. And remember, these images have been given to us by nature. And notice there are these words around the outside as well. Um, so it says, visita interiora terra, visit the interior of the earth. I think that's very profound. So we're going to try and do that through, the, through alchemy, but also through the science of Gaia, which is coming up. We're going to explore the interior of the earth. And then if you do that, you put things right, rectificando. Can you see that's a picture of two white birds bringing a crown up into the heavens. And then mm, if you do that, you will find in Veniers, you will discover the hidden stone. You'll discover the, the philosopher's stone. And look, look at the symbol for the philosopher's stone. It's a young hermaphrodite, hermaphrodite child emerging from the earth. This is coagulation. This is the our experience of, of I call it, being Gaia, of actually having the experience of being within the living earth. Um, so let me see what we're going to next. Let's press that button. Yes, so remember, the, all these operations and planets um, and metals and the whole mandala is, it has itself are the essence of the tree of life. That's what the tree of life is. It contains all of, all of these aspects. And it's a complicated thing, of course. Um, here we are, just to remind you, those two other trees are incorporated into the Azoth mandala. So let's look at the operations in a bit more detail. So calcination, which is this one associated with Saturn, in, in ourselves, that's when we, we have to burn off um, any obstacles we have in ourselves to feeling a connection with Gaia. There are many, many obstacles. Um, one of them is that I found in myself, of course, is that uh, the Earth is, how can, how can the cosmos and how can, how can, how can the Earth be alive? and sentient. That's a ridiculous idea. That's an obstacle that's been put into me by my scientific training. So we have to kind of burn that off. Um, lead is the, is the metal because that gives you a very heavy, leaden, depressing feeling. And Saturn is the planet because Saturn moves very, very slowly through the heavens because he's very far away. So it's very slow, very heavy. Um, but once we've done that burning within ourselves, then we dissolve um, the re remnants of that burning, and we let go into the unconscious. And uh, the element is water. Now we're introducing elements. We have water, um, and we get a, a lovely feeling of dissolution. Now, I should have said, if I can just backtrack, in Gaia, what's the calcination? Well, vol volcanic activity is the calcination. And then, of course, when the planet first accreted from little lumps of rock, um, in the even before the planet existed, before the solar system, as a solar system was forming, amazing huge amounts of energy were required or released when the rocks crashed into each other to form the planets. So that's calcination. Metabolism is calcination. Dissolution, letting go, water. Well, we have to have water on the earth to dissolve rocks to release chemicals that are going to become life. And in myself, I have to dissolve 
into the into the feeling, the watery feeling of of the flow of physical Gaia and of the flow of the unconscious within myself. And then um, we have separation. So the the planet here, uh, the, sorry, the element here is air, Mars, iron. I need to be a bit tough with myself now to 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 realize what's being separated in myself, what's of value, what isn't of value. And in Gaia, of course, is when all the chemicals um, that separate out to form living cells, the different species and evolution separate out. So there's plenty of separation going on in Gaia. And then we get to conjunction, which is um, the earth, the sun, the gold. That's it's inwardly, that's a feeling of connection with Gaia, that first moment of really feeling that you're waking up to Gaia. And in Gaia herself, it's when all the ecosystems and food webs come together in a coherent way. And so you get a, a, a good self-regulating functioning of Gaia, which I'll show you in, in a little while. Fermentation. Well, that conjunction is not enough. You know, you might think you've reached the end of the story. There's never an end. You then have to take that feeling of conjunction inwardly and uh, ferment it, let it decompose, let something new come out of it. And you get a, a sense of inspiration. In Gaia, I think that's when food webs and ecosystems become better and better at cycling nutrients. And it's literal fermentation as well, done by bacteria when they're decomposing dead bodies and leaves and things. And then we have distillation, when we cultivate our insight even more. We're on the track of Gaia. Gaia's now, we're moving towards Gaia because we've made, we've made this effort with our alchemical tree, our tree of life, to move towards her. And she kind of recognizes this and helps us cultivate our insight. And we have the birth of Mercury, you know, this very mercurial sort of understanding. The god Mercury comes to help us in some way. And finally, in coagulation, uh, inward we, in, inwardly, we return to the rediscovery of Gaia. We really are inside Gaia now. We realize that we're living inside a sentient cosmos in, within which Gaia is a sentient planet. And I love the idea that the, the planet is moon for coagulation and the, the metal is silver. And for Gaia, this is when she gets coherent self-regulation, when she's really working very beautifully. So you see, I've tried to show you how these operations apply both to ourselves inwardly in our search for Gaia and the search for the self or in our individuation process, you might say, and in the physical life of the planet herself. And these all come from the tree of life. Now, here's a beautiful statement by um, a 16th century alchemist that Jung was very fond of called Gerard Dorn. And he says of the philosophical tree, which is the same as the alchemical tree, I'll just read this to you. So really try to focus on this as you hear it. The branches of the tree, this alchemical tree, the philosophical tree, the branches spread in such a way that the one is separated from the other by a space of two or three climates and as many regions from Germany, even as far as Hungary and beyond. In this way, the branches of the tree spread through the whole globe of the earth, as in the human body, the veins spread through the different limbs, which are separated from one another. I think that's a beautiful image of, of the tree of life or the alchemical tree, because it's, he's saying it's the actual physical earth. It's not some abstract thing. It's the actual physical earth with um, the branches spreading out in all directions. And Jung, rather like this, and he comments on this in his volume 13 um, of Collected Works. Dawn, he says, draws an impressive picture of the growth, expansion, death, and rebirth of the philosophical tree. Its branches are veins running through the earth, and although they spread to the most distant points of the earth's surface, they all belong to the same immense tree, which apparently renews itself. It's a beautiful image. You know, it's actually an image of um, all the species and all the processes and all the rivers and all the plants and the animals. They're all branches of this tree. Mm. And also Jung has this extra insight, which is that it's constantly renewing itself, this tree. So that the point is that Gaia, the tree of life, is always renewing, always evolving, always changing, always moving in her own evolutionary trajectory. Um, and it's very similar, as Dawn said, to, the, to um, the blood veins, the blood vessels in our bodies. Um, so here we are again. Now, you see, let me just take that back. Now, this mandala, I just want to point out, is actually part of a much bigger alchemical image, 
which I, I think you need to know about, the same alchemical image, but you see it's got lots of things in the background which we haven't got time to go into. This is the same Azoth Mandala from Basil, Valata Basil Valentine. Basically, you can see there's a, a solar side and a lunar side. So this is our intellect, you could say, to speak very simply. And this is our, our moon, our unconscious. Um, we need both of these together to, to realize what this mandala is all about. There's much more going on here. We haven't got time to go into it. But I just wanted to show you that I've actually extracted the mandala from a much wider, much more comprehensive understanding. If you meditate on this, you can get a very profound, comprehensive understanding of psyche and of nature. You don't need anything else, according to the alchemists. Um, there's the reference for you. All right, so that was the alchemical tree of life. Now let's go to the scientific, or the Gaia, scientific Gaia tree of life, and see how we can bring the alchemical tree of life into contact with it. Let's see how, if they can mutually fertilize each other. If they can, if they can be a conjunction and a coagulation between the two, which can bring us to life. Remember, the whole point of this is not an intellectual exercise at all. It's really a, a search for life, a, a, a sense of living within our living planet, so we can love her, adore her, and look after her. So this is Darwin's tree of life um, from 1837, and this is the scientific tree of life. So you see, he has an original ancestor organism. This, of course, was a revolutionary idea. Uh, which the church didn't like to begin with. There's a, 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 a long, long ago, says Darwin, there was an ancestral organism, and then it branched out through the process of evolution by natural selection, which he so brilliantly outlined for us, into many different species. But they're all connected, every single species on the planet are all connected to this original ancestor. It's an amazing insight from 1837, because now we know that's absolutely correct. This is a, a similar tree of life um, from Victorian era. And you, you can see, it's a love, almost an alchemical image, but you can see all these different organisms are actually closely related to each other and they have a common ancestor. Each branch has a common ancestor and it goes back to the original ancestor. So that's the idea of a, the scientific tree of life, that there's an original ancestor organism, which very simple, long, long ago, billions of years ago, which gave rise to all of the living beings, as in, in a way a tree gives rise to branches. Um, here is the scientific tree of life from, a mod, from modern times. This is Luca, which means the last universal common ancestor. We think maybe 4,000 million, year, 4, million years ago. Um, all those chemicals that separated out from the rocks through the process of dissolution and separation got together through the process of conjunction to form the first uh, living being. And then that evolved into the bacteria, many kinds of bacteria, the archaea, which are similar to bacteria, and then eukaryotes, the, the cells that, uh, that we have, cells with nuclei, in which we have the animals, the plants, etc. cetera. Um, and here's a more comprehensive picture of the scientific tree of life. You see, here's the original ancestor here, Luca. 4,000 million years ago, maybe 3,500 million years ago. And it gives rise to all these different species which themselves produce branches. Um, and we are, the plants and the animals are here. The rest of these are mostly, um, are all microorganisms, bacteria and archaea. So you can see that even today, most of the biosphere is composed of uh, bacteria and archaea, single-celled, simple single-celled organisms. Although I shouldn't call them simple, they're incredibly complex. And we are here, the animals and the plants. You see, all from a common ancestor. You get the idea of this tree branching, branching out from an ancestor and then developing more and more forms, more and more incredibly beautiful forms of life and ways of life and ways of living. Some unicellular, some multicellular, but the whole thing branching out in a vast evolutionary process. So here we have the idea of life not just being something static, but something that's evolving, something that I would like to say is seeking for some kind of self-realization, just like we are seeking for our self-realization. And this is a, something in common that we have with the alchemical tree of life, um, the psychological tree of life. Life and ourselves, we're all seeking our self-realization. Um, and in fact, at the base of the tree, where the bacteria are, it's not really a tree at all. It's, it's more like a mycelial network because bacteria can exchange genes like we exchange emails. 
So it's not really a tree. It's more like a bush, but not even a bush. It's more like fungal tubes all merging with each other. And we only get a tree-like structure when we get up into multicellular organisms like ourselves, you know, the animals, the fungi, and the plants, the eukaryotes. These are the cells with nuclei. They're, that's more tree-like. Right, so let's now return to what Dawn said about the tree, the philosophical tree, or the tree of life, and just uh, ponder these, his words again, but now remembering what we've just learned about the scientific tree of life, about the evolution of organisms from a single um, common ancestor into all the multifarious forms that have ever existed. The branches spread in such a way that one is separated from the other by a space of two or three climates and as many regions. So now we can read this, having seen the scientific tree of life, as the branches, meaning different species, different species, they spread out in such a way as one is separated from the other by a space of two or three climates, climates, literally climates, and as many regions, biospheres, climates, from Germany even as far as Hungary and beyond. Of course, the whole planet then is covered with species that have all radiated out from this, uh, the common ancestor, like a tree. In this way, he says, the branches of the tree spread to the whole globe of the earth. Isn't that beautiful? In this way, the branches of the tree, all the species, are spreading all over the earth. Can you imagine that? Um, as in the human body, the veins spread through the different limbs which are separated from one another. Another very important thing here is that he's, he's pointing to the similarity between the human body and the body of the planet. We're both very similar to each other. Um, we'll come back to that later, perhaps. So, um, what are we doing to the tree of life? When I say we, I mean we moderns. Mm. What are we doing to the tree of life? We've established that there's a, a scientific tree of life, very important with all this evolution. It's been going on for at least 3,500 million years until it reaches today with the most astonishing biodiversity. I can tell you, as a scientific ecologist, um, I've seen so much biodiversity in Africa, in Costa Rica, in Venezuela, in India, these places where I've worked as, a, as an ecologist. What are we doing to the tree of life? Well, I think you're probably familiar with, with this. This is depressing, but we have to face up to the fact that we are putting way too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels and also burning biodiversity. This is the famous Keeling curve which shows the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million um, going up since 1958, I think the first records were made on the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii until today. And you can see that uh, the CO2 is going up and this is entirely due to our emissions of carbon dioxide, as I said, from burning fossil fuels. In fact, the actual pre-industrial level is 280 parts per million, and it should be stable somewhere around here. Why we have the zigzag, we haven't got time to go into, but it's, it's basically due to trees, vegetation absorbing CO2 in the, in the uh, summer and releasing in the winter when all the leaves in the northern hemisphere decompose. Now, look at this. This is just to give you an, an idea of how extremely serious this problem is. This is a picture showing... Um, a year's carbon dioxide emissions from New York City, and I don't know if you can make it out, but it's made up of many, many, uh, in fact, 554,000, etc., one-ton spheres of carbon dioxide at atmospheric pressure, sea level. So a ton is a thousand kilograms. And this is a great pile of those uh, one-ton spheres of CO2 emissions only from New York City, only in one year. It was about 10 years ago, so now it'd be worse. Can you see the skyscrapers here? Can you imagine that? That's how much CO2 we're putting in. Well, that's how much CO2 New York was putting in from burning fossil fuels. Can you imagine what the pile of uh, CO2 spheres would look like if we, if we showed the whole Earth, the whole planet's emissions, rather, all the human emissions of carbon dioxide? Um, I mean, that's a huge amount. So this, this I find really shocking. I hope you do as well. It's shocking, both shocking and frightening. 
So this is the effect of burning all this fossil fuel and all burning biodiversity and putting all that, that CO2 and also methane into, the, into our atmosphere. So here we have uh, time going along here, starting with 1880 and going up to 2020. And basically, this is the global temperature um, measured in various ways. And you can see, to begin with, it was nice and cool. And then we have the Industrial Revolution starting here. And it doesn't have much effect, but we're burning CO2 and putting it into the atmosphere. And then it round about now, when the Industrial Revolution really gets going, or rather, in the 1970s, we see the warming going, going up really exponentially fast, really, really fast, until now we're reached... We've reached over one degree centigrade warming in comparison to the 1951-1980 average. And you can see we haven't got a hope in hell of sticking to the um, 1.5 degree centigrade guide rail that was agreed in Paris, I think, in 2015. Not a chance. This is really alarming. And this is what we're doing to the tree of life. We're basically calcinating it. This is a massive calcination on the part of our culture, of, of our entire planet. And what's going to happen, you can see here, this is the idea of, of tipping points from my friend Tim Lenton and various other people, other, other scientists. These are various, uh, he calls them tipping points, various parts of the Gaian system, which are very vulnerable. I won't read them all, but we've got the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the tropical coral reefs. Uh, we've got Labrador sea current, mountain glaciers, the Amazon rainforest collapsing. Um, etc etc and this is where we are now this is the temperature we've reached now about 1.1 degree centigrade warming compared to pre-industrial levels now here's the important thing can you see this 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 uh, red dot here when we get to this red dot um, then it looks like the tipping point in question is going to collapse and collapse really fast um, and the 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 pink um, arrow, the pink bar, sorry, that's a sort of error margin. So we're not entirely sure when it's going to happen. You can see already that we're, we're here. We already know the Greenland ice sheet is collapsing and the West Antarctic ice sheet is collapsing. That's going to be disastrous. Just that's going to raise the sea level hugely. When we get to around uh, 2 degrees or 2.5 degrees or 2 degrees warming, we're going to start losing the Amazon. It's an absolute catastrophe. These all just tip like dominoes, basically, as the temperature gets warmer and warmer. And the whole planet moves towards a very hot state, a very unstable hot state. This is the idea of the tipping point, just very briefly. So here we have our forcing variable. So this could be our global warming. We're putting more and more CO2, more and more CO2. And this could be the stability of the Amazon, let's say. And as you, you can see, as we add more and more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels, mm, not much happens because the Amazon is able to absorb some CO2. You know, it's almost as if Gaia gives us a gift. We're allowed to burn some fossil fuels, but only up to a certain point. If we burn too many fossil fuels, what happens is there's a sudden shift. The Amazon collapses really rapidly and unexpectedly and tips itself no longer into a forest, but into a savanna, a very dry savanna. And we lose all the cooling functions of the Amazon forest, and that makes the whole planet warm even further. So I hope you're very depressed by all that, because if you're not depressed, you must go and see a therapist, you know. The right reaction to this, these data from the science is, is, is depression, alarm, and even fear. You know, this, what we're doing to the planet alchemically is we're calcinating it really fast. Um, what's driving all this is obviously um, a crisis in our world view. We're, we're not seeing the world in the right way, we moderns, are we really? I mean, otherwise we wouldn't be calcining our planet like this. So you probably know why this is happening, but let's just go into it very briefly. Um, now, we can pick up where the problem with um, Western culture really got quite serious during the scientific revolution, although it started long, long before. Um, but let's just pick up the story during the scientific revolution, because this is when things started going really, really wrong for ourselves and for the planet. And here we have one of my favorite philosophers. I'm being a bit sarcastic here, although he was an absolute genius at mathematics, but I wish he'd kept his, his fingers out of philosophy, I must say. Descartes. 
And he came up with this, well, he didn't come up with it, but he, he really pushed this idea, which was taken on board by the whole culture eventually, and, and which has led really, you could say, to the destruction of the planet, to the calcination of the planet, which I've just shown you. And here, here is his famous phrase, I have described the earth and the whole visible universe, are you ready for this, in the manner of a machine, in the manner of a machine. In other words, there's no soul in nature. Um, there is soul within the human being, but only in the human being. Everything else in nature, animals, plants, rocks, rivers, atmosphere, oceans, they have no soul. It's just a massive machine. And we can understand how the machine works through with mathematics and quantification. So if we can measure all the aspects of nature that we want to understand, then we will have complete power and control and dominion over nature. And that's exactly what we should do, he said. We need to use this new mathematical, quantitative, reductionist approach to nature so that we can dominate nature. And it was understandable at the time because there were plagues, you know, there were famines, and nobody really understood what on earth was driving these things. So it was understandable that this approach, you know, was helpful, and it has been extremely helpful in understanding these things. But we, at, it came at a great price. We lost our connection with the soul. Um, now, just to give you an example of how seriously he took this and how seriously our culture still takes this mechanistic worldview, when, when uh, he, want, he wanted his followers to open live dogs, to do vivisection on live dogs and open them up, they, they stuck them on boards, they pinned them to boards, and they opened them up live to see how the machinery worked inside. And Descartes said to his followers, when the dogs scream in pain, ignore the screams, for they are merely the creakings of a machine. I mean, that's really, that's really horrendous. Um, and this is what's led to the problem. Now, my friend Julian David has written a lovely book um, called A Brief History of God. And he takes this story way back to the Neolithic, when um, sky god cultures from Middle Europe, who who worship this masculine warlike sky god overran the feminine Gaia worshiping cultures uh, of the Neolithic and wiped out the mother goddess cultures and replaced them with the sky god culture. And you could say that this view of Descartes is the sky god once again, only this time it's a mathematical engineering sky god that's taken over. And I think our whole culture is obsessed unconsciously with um, the same sky god that wiped out the Gaia mother goddess cultures. And we've got to reverse that. We've got to come back into Gaia uh, through the union, I think, of science and depth psychology or alchemy or the tree of life. So this idea that the world has a soul or this insight that the world has a soul, as you know, is called the anima mundi, the soul of the world in Latin, or the suki ton cosmu, I believe, in Greek, which is even nicer, suke, psyche. The whole universe has a soul. Every speck of matter has a soul has some kind of sentience, some kind of awareness. This, another way of expressing this is this is panpsychism, psyche everywhere, pan everywhere, psyche. I, this is a nice symbol of it. And I think all the traditional cultures in the world, apart from ours, had this view. So here are some traditional cultures. We had it too, in, even in medieval Europe, which was very destructive of nature in some ways. Even in medieval Europe, every, it was obvious to everyone that trees had souls, that rivers had souls, etc. And we can find it in Shakespeare, you know, in his play Act uh, As You Like It. I think it's Act Act Two, Scene One, or something like that. He has the Duke saying, um, tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, and sermons in stones. That's an expression of the anima, anima mundi, you know. Um, tongues in trees. So when you go out into the forest, the trees actually speak to you if you know how to listen, if you have an anima mundi Gaia perspective, which I think we can develop through a mixture of the science of Gaia and alchemical Gaia, uh, the alchemical tree. Um, tongues in trees, books in brooks, sermons in stones. It's be absolutely beautiful expression from Shakespeare of this anima mundi point of view. So this anima mundi point of view comes back to the myth of Gaia, which, of course, Jules is such an expert in and has educated us all in so beautifully with her books and her speaking. 
So let's just visit the, the myth of Gaia because this is what we need to recover and, and, and reintegrate the myth of Gaia, the mythological experience of Gaia with our scientific understanding of Gaia from James Lovelock. So here is Hesiod, 700 BC, writing about Gaia. Listen to the language, Gaia, the beautiful. You see, Gaia's beautiful. It's not a machine. She's beautiful. She rose up broad bosom. So broad bosom means she really takes care of you like a mother, you know. She gives you mother's milk, which is the insight of connectedness, the feeling of connectedness with the birds, with the, with the trees, with the oceans, with everything. She that is the steadfast base of all things, and you can rely on her. She's, the, she's, the, she's really reliable. She's the base of everything. And then when she was born out of primordial chaos, she gave birth to the stars, to the heavens, to Uranus, her son. Mm. And from then they mated, and from that mating came the gods and goddesses, and eventually um, all the species and the human beings. So that's the ancient myth of Gaia, you see, and she came out of primordial chaos, this vast intelligence that wanted to be something because it, it felt lonely in itself before there was time, before there was matter, before there was space. It wanted to become something and it became this brilliant, brilliant idea to create a planet and then a universe of matter through which it could see itself. But we'll come back to that later when we look at the Kabbalistic tree. There's little Hesiod, you see. Gaia's bigger than Hesiod. Um, and this is just a little reference for you. So there's Descartes, you know, he destroyed that view. He said, no, it's, it's not a soul. Um, sorry, a very bad French accent. But he said, you know, it's, it's not a soul. That whole Gaia business is, is just infantile nonsense. It's only for children and, you know, re <laughs> retards and people. It's not like that at all. It's wrong. The whole earth, the whole universe, get used to it. It's only a dead machine. And we are here to control it using mathematics and what later became science. Now, Jung, of course, came to our rescue to get us out of this horrible mechanistic worldview, which we're all brought up in. I was brought up in it, especially like all scientists, without even realizing that I was being brought up in this view. You know, sort of, I was unconscious. So he says we have these four ways of knowing. I'm sure you're familiar with this, so I won't go into details. Intuition, sensing, feeling, and thinking. And Descartes' way of thinking was the wrong way of thinking, which led us to destroy, is leading us to destroy our planet through calcination. But we need a, is there a different kind of thinking that's still rational and scientific, but is consistent with Gaia, with the ancient Gaia, with the myth of Gaia, with the anima mundi? And this is where Lovelock comes in with his Gaia theory and with his system science of the earth. Um, and my approach to Gaia theory is looking for Dornian veins of relationship in the tree of life. You remember Dawn and that wonderful description of the tree of life that he gave. Let's see if we can find these Dornian veins of relationship in the tree of life, the physical tree of life, the biological Gaia tree of life, which is, of course, the alchemical tree of life. Here's James Lovelock. And I like to think that uh, Gaia gave him the idea that the earth is alive um, around about the 1960s when the ecological crisis was really really getting serious she needed to find a scientist to speak to her to uh, to the culture she tried all the poets in in the west and you know they're all absolutely brilliant but that the science the poets didn't bring about any cultural change of any significance the industrial revolution still happened despite Wordsworth and Coleridge etc so by 1960s, things are getting very bad. Gaia's looking for a scientist to speak for her, and she pops up in his garden, looks into his soul, and thinks, aha, he's the one I've been waiting for. And later, Lynn Margulis, the great American microbiologist, evolution biologist, joined in um, his quest for Gaia and his, his scientific elaboration of Gaia. So let's just have a look at what that is. In the 1960s, before Gaia came to Lovelock and gave him the insight of a living Earth as, as a scientific hypothesis, Scientists thought that the Earth was nothing more than a dead ball of rock. And it had these four components, the biota, to say the sum of all life, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, and the ones you've never heard of, unless you're a biologist, the protoctista, the sort of seaweeds and paramecium and amoebae. And then we've got the rocks, the atmosphere and the water. And the rocks are basically in charge because in the rock departments, 
we have volcanoes. They emit carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas. And the poor old biota, the living beings, they have to adapt to the conditions set for them by the non-living environment, particularly the, the volcanoes and the rocks, or they die. They go extinct. Can you see the biota have no influence on the rocks, the atmosphere and the water? That was the view in the 1960s. And then Lovelock comes along and it's a long story how he got to this insight. It was when he was working for NASA, trying to help them look for life on Mars by sending landers up to Mars. He began to ask himself, how can one detect life at the level of an entire planet? And it's a long story, but basically he got the insight that those four components are still the same on a living planet, which is our planet, but that the biota have huge impacts on the rocks and the atmosphere. He actually got the Gaia insight through the atmosphere. His first paper in 1972, first scientific paper in 1972, is called Gaia as seen through the atmosphere. And he realized that um, Gaia, the living earth, has regulated the oxygen in the atmosphere for uh, around 300 million years at 20% or so, which is remarkable. So living beings have huge influences on the rocks. We wouldn't have many kinds of rocks without life. We wouldn't have a breathable atmosphere without life and the water would have disappeared long ago without life keeping it on the surface of the planet. So biota affect the rocks and the atmosphere and then those very conditions feed back to determine which of the biota can survive in the very conditions they've created for themselves. Mm. So now we don't have a linear cause and effect like we had before in the pre-Gaia view. We've got a feedback situation in which we can't say which is cause and which is, a, which is effect. So you get this idea of tight coupling, as Lovelock would say, between life, rocks, atmosphere and water. And he had the insight that when we get these tight couplings through through cybernetic feedbacks between these four components something completely unexpected happens something emerges from those relationships we call that in science an emergent property and that is the ability of the whole system the whole gaia system whole earth system to regulate key aspects of its surface such as temperature and distribution of key elements within the narrow limits that life can tolerate over vast spans of geological time so the idea is that we get the emergence of planetary scale self-regulation, just like we as an organism, as individual humans, we have temperature regulation and acidity regulation in our blood. We're full of feedbacks that are regulating key aspects of our metabolism as we're speaking. He said the earth is no different. It also has self-regulating feedbacks that emerge from these relationships between the four components of the earth. And later on, he got the name Gaia for this from his friend, William Golding. He didn't know anything about Gaia, but William Golding gave him the name Gaia when they were walking. Lovelock wanted to call this idea of his the bio-cybernetic universal system tendency, the bust hypothesis. But he accepted the name Gaia from Golding. And this is the moment, I think, during that walk with Golding in the English countryside, around about 1968 or so, um, when Gaia comes back into our culture after a, an exile of 2,000 years and persecution of 2000 years, real persecution. And it's fantastic and ironic and cl very clever of Gaia to put herself back into our culture through the mouth and through the voice of a scientist. And not just Lovelock, but Margulis, so a man and a woman scientist. See, it's very hermaphroditic, Gaia. So we have Gaia back in our culture now as science. And I just want to give you an example of one of these feedbacks. Um, so it doesn't remain, the guy doesn't remain in an abstract realm. And then we'll come to the Kabbalistic tree, and hopefully if we have time, to the deep ecology tree. Mm. So this is a real live guy and organism that we're going to follow um, in this simple feedback I'm going to show you. This is a, a tiny marine alga. You see, this is two microns. So it's about a mi two microns or three mi or four microns wide. A micron is one thousandth of a millimeter. Uh, these beautiful, beautiful shells are made out of chalk. I mean, this little organism is a mandala maker. Look at her, these beautiful mandalas. We're not going to follow the story of the carbon in these shells. That's another guy on feedback that for, for another time, perhaps. But we are going to follow what it does in the ocean because it lives in the ocean. Here we are. Uh, these, these mandalas are white, so they're chalky. And when 
You look, you can see them from space. This is a bloom of these little algae. They're called coccolithophores, which means carrier of little stone berries. The stone berries being those chalk mandalas. And I'm here somewhere in the southwest England, and Jules is sort of round about here. And this is not milk. These are this is a very small bloom of these algae. They can be huge. These algae, algal blooms of coccolithophores. And here they are sitting in the ocean. You see these little chalk forming algae. And they emit a gas called di dimethyl sulfide. It's a sulfurous gas, so it's quite an alchemical gas. It's got the alchemical element sulfur in it for activity, you know. And this is the gas that you smell when you go down to the sea and you pick up some seaweed. And you breathe in this, the seaweed, and that's this dimethyl, tangy sort of sulfurous gas. That's dimethyl sulfide. And to cut a very long story short, the gas that's emitted by the algae goes up into the atmosphere where there's lots of water vapor dying to become a cloud. And the water vapor needs something to condense on in order to um, become a cloud. And the gas dimethyl sulfide is a perfect cloud condensation nucleus. So the algae emit the gas into the atmosphere above the ocean, which is full of water vapor, and the gas triggers the condensation of clouds. And those clouds are dense and white, and they reflect solar energy back to space and thereby cool the Earth. It's an astonishing thing. Lovelock was involved in discovering this. So now, based on that, we can explore a very simple version of quite a complex self-regulating feedback involving the algae, the gas that they emit, and the clouds that the gas uh, produces. So here we have the ocean, and here we have the atmosphere, and here we have the boundary between the two. And here are our coccolithophore algae. So imagine um, there's lots of coccolithophores, there's going to be lots of gas production. So this arrow means if there's lots of this, there's lots of that, and if there's not much of this, there's not much of that. We call that in science a direct coupling. So imagine there's lots of coccolithophores in the ocean, they produce lots of gas. And if there's lots of gas, I'm sure you can guess there's going to be lots of clouds. And if there's lots of clouds, that's going to affect the sea surface temperature in an inverse way. So the more clouds there are, <clears throat> the lower the sea surface temperature, because as I said, the clouds are reflecting solar energy back to space. And so that energy can't reach the sea surface and warm it. So the sea surface temperature goes down. And therefore, there are fewer coccolithophore blooms because it's colder. They don't grow so well. They don't reproduce so well. Therefore, there's less gas production by the algae. Therefore, there are fewer clouds. And now the sun can reach the surface of the ocean, at least at midday, and warm it. And that creates perfect conditions for the coccolithophores to reproduce and for their population to grow. Mm. And so that they produce more gas, which then leads to more clouds, which then reduces the sea surface temperature, which means there are fewer of the algae, less gas, fewer clouds, etc. So this is a self-regulating feedback. If you, if you plot the behavior of the uh, feedback over time, and you can make a mathematical model of it, we find that it the temperature stays more or less stable. It wobbles a bit, but it stays more or less stable. So this is what we call a negative feedback, question mark, because it only operates in certain parts of the ocean, but it seems to work. And the, this is a, we've just followed a Dornian vein of relationship in the tree of life. You know, um, these algae are part of are one of those veins, one of those branches that Dawn talked about. And then the whole feedback relationship is also another kind of Dornian vein. You know, the relationships that give self-regulation. It's the same idea from Dawn of the alchemical tree being like a, a series of veins over the earth. So you see, this is one place where we can meld the alchemical tree with the scientific tree, but we have to do it with our meditation. So this has so far all been thinking. Notice from Jung's four functions, we've been thinking, but we've been thinking in a different way, not mechanistically. We've been thinking holistically in terms of feedbacks, cybernetics, um, complex relationships, emergent properties, complexity. These are all ways of thinking that are consistent with Gaia. But to really, really understand and experience Gaia, we need to have our feeling, <clears throat> our sensing and our intuition involved. And this is where the alchemical understanding of the tree of life comes in. We need to understand that intuitively. We need to sense the living earth 
our, of our planet with our senses and we need to feel the value of it and if we do that by melding we can do that by melding the alchemical tree of life with the biological or Gaian tree of life and it's not just the ocean organisms that produce um, clouds the land plants do it too these are the different biomes vegetation biomes on the surface of the planet and let's take the Amazon the Amazon forest trees and plants they produce cloud seeding chemicals as well they're a bit more complicated than dimethyl sulfide and some of them are very medicinal for us um, here's one that smells like geraniums here's one that smells like pine here's a camphor smelling one beautiful co complex molecules that require a lot of energy to make um, they're ca carefully crafted, you know, not like di dimethyl sulfide, which the algae make. That's terribly simple. But these out these chemicals, these molecules are much more complicated. So the Amazon, let's say, releases hordes and hordes in of these chemicals into the atmosphere above itself, and they seed clouds. And those clouds um, cool cool the forest, cool the earth, and also <clears throat> help rain to fall. So they trigger rainfall. Mm. And now we know that before human, human beings started calcining the planet in the way I showed you with climate change by burning fossil fuels and burning biodiversity, most of the planet, most of the clouds on the planet were produced by life. And the low clouds like these ones um, are planet cooling clouds. So just take that on board, you know, life makes planet cooling clouds. This is one of those Dornian veins of relationship. You think back to the Dornian alchemical or philosophical tree of life and think of these feedbacks. Um, you can begin to imagine how the Dornian tree of life melds together with the scientific tree of life. And those operations I mentioned as well, those seven operations, those seven metals, those seven planets are here as well. If we had more time, we could explore um, how these operations apply to the science in order to get a deep experience of Gaia. This is what I've tried to do in my book, Gaia Alchemy. Um, so just another picture of clouds seen from space. Just imagine that those clouds before humans are mostly made by life. What happens above the Amazon is quite interesting because when the clouds, when the clouds are made, the water vapor, water gas condenses out into clouds and that reduces the air pressure above the forest. So there's a kind of partial vacuum and that partial vacuum sucks in moist air from the Atlantic Ocean. And that moist air is then, of course, itself, the water in the air is converted into clouds. And we get a very complex circulation of uh, water vapor and clouds and rain moving westwards across the Amazon towards the Andes. And it's all triggered by cloud seeding chemicals released by the forest. It's quite a remarkable example of Gaia in action. All right, so now let's see how we can apply the Kabbalistic tree of life. What about the Kabbalistic tree of life? Can this help us to get a deeper sense of connection with Gaia, the living Gaia? Well, let's go back to the ancient Greek, Greek myth, as written down by Hesiod. He said, chaos was first of all. So I mentioned this earlier, it's very important, this. The idea that there was this vast intelligence, which the Greeks called chaos, before there was time, before there was matter, before there was space, there was this chaos, as they called it, vast and dark for them. And I, I like to think it felt lonely, you know, it wanted, it wanted to be fulfilled. It, it didn't, it wasn't being, it wasn't realizing itself. It was just kind of static, I suppose. So it had this brilliant idea that if it created time, matter and space and put things uh, into matter in time and space, that the things of matter could get to know chaos, each through their own perspective, you know, each each different atom, molecule, organism, species would would get could get to know uh, the chaos in its own way. And that way, chaos would become fulfilled. It would know itself through myriad, my, myriad ways. This is an old idea. Um, that Spinoza, of course, had himself, the great philosopher, the great Jewish philosopher. And he was Jewish, and this connects us with the Kabbalistic tree, which, of course, comes from the Jewish tradition. Uh, it's probably worth saying that my own father um, was a Kabbalist, and so I had Kabbalah in my life when I was very young. 
I didn't understand it, but I sort of realized there was something very deep going on with Kabbalah. And here is Gaia again. Um, and here is the Kabbalistic tree of life. And remember, it's a tree of life again. It's a different manifestation of this archetypal image that comes to us from the depths of nature that wants us to, it's trying to, it's given to us by nature so that we can find our way back into nature or that, so we don't lose our connection with the living qualities of nature. And in the Kabbalistic tree, you see, we have these called, they're called ten sephiroths, which are ten aspects of manifestation going all the way from Keter, as the Kabbalists call it, which I like to think of as the chaos in, in the Greeks, the creative source of all. That's Keter in the Kabbalah. So here's the ancient Greek chaos. And then what happens is this, this great, great intelligence I mentioned, it goes through these different forms of itself until it ends up at physical matter down here in Malkut. Let's just go through them. So somehow wisdom appears, the first thing that appears in the Kabbalistic tree from Keter, Greek chaos, is wisdom. Some kind of sense of wisdom. We can't understand it. It's so difficult for us to know what this really is. Then we go to understanding. And then there's this sense of knowledge. And these are very archetypal. Um, it's long before we have human, human consciousness. There is wisdom. There is understanding, there is knowledge. These are the first things that manifest out of the Greek's chaos or the Kabbalistic Keter. It's important to realize this is not human wisdom or human understanding or human knowledge. It's, it's, these, are, these are aspects of the psyche of um, Keter and chaos which are manifesting themselves gradually towards matter. Then we have mercy and severity. So notice we have these two pillars, you see, it's like yin and yang. And as Jung pointed out, they're about the opposites. They're the opposites. There's the pillar of mercy and the pillar of severity in the tree of life, in the Kabbalistic tree of life. And then we get to this wonderful central sephiroth, which mirrors is a lower form of the knowledge, which is called Tiferet, which is beauty. I like to think of it um, as the self, the ecological self or the Jungian self, this feeling of coagulation. I think it would be alchemic in the alchemical tree, sense of really being in the beauty of nature and then that's not enough because that then becomes instinct and then finally almost finally our intellect this is now in the human realm here you could say this is the, the realm of species and hu humanity um, intelligence or intellect and then here comes our ego yes or is our ego our sense of self and finally physical matter Gaia so you see this manifestation like a lightning flash coming down. And for in the Greek sense, this would be keter, chaos, going through all these phases of manifestation until we get the physical Gaia that we mentioned earlier on, you know, the mother of all, the steadfast, steadfast base of all things. And so let's apply that to the uh, Kabbalistic, sorry, to the, uh, the feedback I just showed you with the algae and the life of the algae. Let's try and look at that Kabbalistically. But this time we're going to go work up from physicality towards um, Keter. So the Malkut, the physical, is the, al the physical algal body. That's the physical body I just showed you. Then the Yesod, uh, or the ego of the alga, is the algal psyche, you know, how it responds as a psychological being to its surroundings and to its environment and to other algae um, and to predators, etc. Then the intelligence, the uh, intellect, I like to think that as the, the actual cloud algal feedback that I showed you, which is full of intelligence, a self-regulating intelligence of the algae, which the algae contributes to. Can you see what we're doing? We're trying to meld this Kabbalistic tree with the scientific understanding so that we can feel more alive in Gaia. And then um, Netzach, which is the instinct, is the algal life cycle of you know birth and death and how the algae reproduce. And then Tifret, the beauty, I think is algal's, the algal's contribution to a healthy Gaia. And then we get a beautiful self-regulating planet to which the algae contribute. And then um, severity, well, that's natural selection, I think, because it's pretty severe natural selection. If you don't, if you don't, uh, so can't survive well in your environment, you'll get pushed out by natural selection. Others, other individuals will push you out, other species will push you out. So that's it's quite severe. But mercy, 
is the algal ecological niche. It's where it feels comfortable. It finds it's a nice job for itself in the global ecosystem, and in this case, in the marine ecosystem. And it's got a nice sort of operating space, and that's merciful for it. It's a sort of algal niche. Um, and then we lose, we go back into the archetypal. I like to think somehow Keter or Chaos receives the knowledge, the experience that the algae have had as physical beings and as psychological beings in these lower aspects of the Kabbalistic tree. That knowledge, and it, it's fed upwards into a kind of understanding. So the whole, the whole of, of, of this, this great intelligence now has more knowledge about itself and more understanding about itself this time given to it by the physical life of and the physical feedbacks in which the algae are involved. And then, of course, the wisdom, the uh, keter, chaos feels wisdom, and finally all of that goes back to the Greek chaos. And I think somehow that chaos being, the keter being, the vast luminescent intelligence, which is beyond our understanding, feels satisfied with these little algae. Ah, oh, there are the little algae. This is marvelous. I've learned something about myself that I never knew through the algae. And of course, this applies to every single species on the planet, every single planet in, this, in the solar system, in the universe, every single galaxy, every single molecule, every single electron, every single subatomic particle. They're all feeding back knowledge, understanding and wisdom um, to Keter, to the great uh, creative chaos. So finally, let's combine these three trees into the deep ecology tree of life. Because deep ecology really is about action. It's about how we live our lives in the world, in the, in the light of our understanding and wisdom and understanding of these, our chemical tree and the scientific Gaia tree. Deep ecology was coined by um, Arnie Ness, who also taught at the college and I became friends with him too. And um, Pering Var Hawkland, who's also a dear friend. We've just taught a course together at Schumacher online called Deep Ecology and the Tree of Life. We'll probably do that again at some point because it worked very, worked very well. He took Arnie's ideas about deep ecology um, and converted them into an image of a tree, which he calls the ecosophical tree. You see how the tree as an alchemical image popped into his mind. I mean, Per Ingvar didn't know very much about Jungian psychology, but he knew a lot about Arnie's philosophy. He could work with Arnie for many years. And he came up, I think, once again, he was given this image of a philosophical tree, rather, sorry, deep ecology tree, by Gaia, by, by the cosmos, by Keter, by primordial chaos, if you like. And basically, you can see we've got four components again. We've got the roots, which are our deep experiences of belonging to Gaia, which I call being gaia um, And there's many different kinds of deep experiences that different people can have or that we can have as individuals but all these deep experiences have something in common and just to be very brief about that what they have in common is the intuitive insight that all life has intrinsic value irrespective of its value to humans all life has intrinsic value this we get to our intuition and with our feeling not through our intellect we can't defend this intellectually it's something from given to us by a feeling function and by our intuitive function then the branches are uh, explorations of how we're going to live our life life in gaia so uh, how am i going to what are my options as a parent what are my options as a teacher what are my options as a football coach whatever it might be we explore our options options that are consistent with <clears throat> the intrinsic value of all life insight and with our deep experience and then we make a fruit and a fruit is an action in the world a real concrete action and of course those seven alchemical operations that we looked at with the alchemical tree are in the fruits and they're also in the deep experience and in the trunk and in our course this is what we explored they're in the fruits so for example I might need to burn away <clears throat> certain obstacles in myself in order to produce a, a physical, I mean, a real fruit in the world, mm. a pro guy in action in the world. And I might need to dissolve certain things and I might need to separate certain, certain things, etc., etc. <clears throat> so those operations are in the, are in the performing of the fruit involves the operations. And then the fruit falls to the ground and creates a new ecological, deep ecological tree. 
Um, and we come to the real life action in our real life world. And we do something positive, pro Gaian, for humanity and for all the species and all the rocks and the atmosphere and the waters. And we do this because we've been guided through this approach, which I've tried to describe to you, in which we put together the depth psychology understanding that Jung gave us of alchemy, the seven operations. We meditate on the seven operations. We might meditate on the Kabbalistic tree. We put all that together with the science of Gaia, which was given by Gaia for us via James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. We put those together and then at times we can experience the flowering of the ecological tree, the growth of the Kabbalistic tree, of the tree of life within ourselves. And then we can really, really do something to help ourselves get out of this terrible situation that modernity has created in the world. So that's what I would urge us to do as a culture, to rediscover Gaia through uh, a union of depth psychological understanding of the tree of life via alchemy and our scientific understanding of Gaia through the science of Lovelock and Margulis. Okay, I think that's probably enough. Thank you very much for listening. And now um, I think Jules may be able to give us some of the questions you may have been uh, writing in the chat, or maybe Jules has some questions of her own. Here she is. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm. Now we do have a few questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of them is, do humans have any beneficial role in Gaia or are we just mm -hmm. a plague species? Yes, that's an interesting question. Well, Lynn Margulis, my friend and, and collaborator, she came up with this phrase, humans are a pox, a pox called man, you know, we're, we're like a virus on the planet. I didn't like that at all. I, and the reason I don't like it is because humans in our essence um, are totally in love with Gaia. I mean, look at healthy little children, you know, they love trees and they love running around in the woods and splashing around in the water, don't they? I mean, children are Gaians. As long as they haven't been disturbed, you know, by bad parenting or bad influences, every single human being is naturally pro Gaian. We're born like that. It's our birthright. And it's our birthright to be able to develop our connection with Gaia as we grow up. So it's not humanity that's the pox, it's modernity that's the pox. Modernity certainly is a disease on the planet. Um, you know, and that modernity, as we saw, comes from these ideas from Descartes and others that the whole universe is nothing more than a dead machine with no intrinsic value, etc., that we can dominate for our purposes. That's the pox. Um, and what happens, of course, is when, when a species arrives in Gaia that destabilizes the whole, she can't sort of help herself. She sets in trained feedbacks that will regulate the numbers of that species. And we've seen that recently with the coronavirus. You know, we're still in the pandemic. That's not over. And um, there are earthquakes. Well, earthquakes are natural. I wouldn't say earthquakes, but uh, the virus, coronavirus is a classic guy in feedback. Modernity becomes anti-Gaia, too, too many of us with consuming too much, destroying too much biodiversity, bingo, a virus comes and tries to reduce our numbers. War is another one, you know, the, the, terrible, the terrible psychological disturbances that come about in us because we disturb too much Gaia, that creates wars. And we're seeing a war right now in Ukraine. Let's hope it doesn't get worse, but it could do. So just to summarize, it's not humans that are a pox, it's our modernity. And our real role as human beings in Gaia is to adore her, to love her, um, and to find ways of living well with her so that she can have her self-realization and we can help her have her self-realization. After all, we're the only species that, that can tell her her own story, her own evolutionary story over time. There's no other species that can tell her that, that you were once a molten ball of rock and then oceans came from the, from the asteroid belt you know, in, in big meteorite uh, comets 
and then they'd species the first bacteria and all of that, all that incredible evolution. There's no other species that can tell her that. Only we can. We only we can give her that her own story. And I think she needs that for her own self-realization. I think she needs our scientific understanding for her own self-realization. And that's our role, I think, to love Gaia and to tell her about herself through myth and through science combined together. Yes, mm. wonderful reply. So here's another question. How can I develop a good relationship with Gaia and the Tree of Life? Uh, well, I think it's very important for everyone to have what I call a Gaia place. Um, this is not the same as a sit spot. I mean, sit spots are well known. This is not quite the same thing. So what one does is find a place in nature very close to your house, which is which just calls you as a place where you can go and meditate and all of these things. I call it a Gaia place. It's very good to have a tree. So in your Gaia place, if you have a tree, that becomes your Gaia tree. And you can just visit your tree, make an off or your Gaia place. With, go with an offering, maybe a little. I like to bring stones from the sea, little pebbles I find by the sea, and I give them to my Gaia place. And I sit there very quietly. The other thing I do also is I make an Azoth mandala out of 14 sticks in my Gaia place. And I make that on the ground very mindfully. And I, I watch what happens. Sometimes a bird will come along, you know, and sing me a significant song. For me, the wrens are particularly sacred, and I really listen to the song of the wren. Or something else synchronistic might happen to you when you do that, when you approach your guy place in that way. You can also bring, you can also bring an image of the alchemical tree and, and contemplate it, or read some love lock and contemplate in your guy place. And then the idea in, the, in your guy place is that you, you, you spread your consciousness out from the guy, your guy place to the whole planet. So you, 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 you imagine to the north um, all the ecosystems and oceans and mountains that are to your north and similarly to your south, to your east and to your west. And in your, you invite in your images of those places to come into you from the rest of the planet. So you invite Gaia to show you these places, uh, invite her to take her into herself um, and to, sh to give you the experience of being gaia as I call it, which is the knowledge that the planet really is alive that there really, it, she really does have a soul, that she really is a vast intelligence, and that the cosmos is the same. So that's what we can do with our Gaia place. And also, we need to transform that into action, that sort of, in, that sort of experience. So we, we then offer something to our community. It could be something very small, like doing shopping for a neighbor, or it could be something very big, like starting Extinction Rebellion or something like that. But it's not, it's not enough just to have the guy experience of oneself. One needs to share it with one's community. And one needs to do something for the whole of Gaia, for the benefit of Gaia. So there's two aspects. Gaia place and then action based on a peaceful democratic action based on what we discover in our Gaia place. One last thing. Some people live in cities and they haven't got access to much nature. So you can make a Gaia place indoors, you know, with just some plants. I have a Gaia place in my house for the winter time when it's raining, like now. I have a little table with some plants and I sit there and that becomes my Gaia place. And I let my imagination flow into it. Um, one cultivates one's imagination. I think of imagination as the ability to receive images from Gaia and to communicate with Gaia with our own images. No, yeah. I just we make a personal relationship. It's absolutely crucial that we Person, do, personal we, relationship. Whoever will will make that's, one with us, as it were. That's right. So it's you know it's no good thinking. Oh, who am I? I'm just insignificant little person. No, you're not. Um, each human consciousness is vast, um, and as Jung pointed out, you know, if every individual could become a real individual. I would say within the body of Gaia can really realize their personal relationship, as you say, Jules, with the living body of Gaia. That makes a huge difference to the whole. My friend David Abraham, the great American eco philosopher, he has a lovely way of putting it. He says, We have two bodies. We have this body, our little human body, which lives inside its larger body, or our larger body, which is the body of Gaia. Mm. So I live inside Gaia, 
Every individual lives inside Gaia, just like microbes live inside our guts. And our relationship is very important. Every individual relationship is important with Gaia. So we are important. I don't like this idea that humans are a pox or that we're not important. We are, as I mentioned earlier. Every individual matters. Yes. And another question. Do you think the entire universe is conscious in some way? Definitely. I think it's easy to answer <laughs> that. <huh? laughs> yeah. But the thing is, you know, the word think is a problem. Yeah. I mean, I can think it. I can like the idea. But to experience it is another matter. You know, I can think it as much as I like. But then I don't really experience it. I just hold it as a, an intellectual view, which I know must be right. But for it to be real, I need to have moments where I really know it through my intuition, through my sensing, through, through my feeling. It has to, almost has to be a gift from Gaia given to us, you know, gift from the cosmos. Oh, now for some reason, you can, you, I show you that I'm sentient. I don't know how it happens. I think it's through cultivating a good life, you know, through thinking about your relationships, our relationships by trying to be good to other people good to animals, good to plants. Um, rewilding is very important. I forgot to mention that. If you have a little garden, rewild as much of it as you can. Like you, Jules, with your bird feeders, you know. Just try and help the wild beings in your garden as much as you possibly can. We do that in our garden as well. And maybe if you do all of that, maybe uh, I'm being very naive, but perhaps the universe looks down on you or looks within you or is, in, in, is within you and says, okay, now, thank you for all that. Here, have the reward, boom. And suddenly you have this experience of the reality of the sentience of the universe. That's a lovely way to end. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Stefan. It was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Jules. Thank you for moderating. It's lovely you were lovely with me on the Lovely to see thing. you again. I you think too. I have to stop now, somehow or other. <laughs> All right, well, I'll just play a little bit of music. To okay, stop, yes, true, yeah, whatever. And then um, as an offering to Gaia and as a thank, thanks to Aras for putting this on. Thank you so much, Stefan and Jules, for this excellent, excellent presentation. And thank you all for being here and taking part in this event. We'll be announcing more events in this series soon, so please stay tuned. Uh, in the meantime, please feel free to leave any comments, questions, or reflections in the ARIS Forum, which is part of Archipelago, the Outreach Center on our website, ARIS.org. If any images came to mind during today's event, please send them to info at eris.org and we will add them to our Gaia gallery. And if you've missed any of the events in this series, the videos are all there as well. Thank you again for coming today and we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>